Great. Good morning. It is January 6th and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Uh, we are uh, here today. Uh, we're going to be learning about Justice Reinvestment to work groups work and uh, have my dogs, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, very honored to have uh, Chief Justice Paul River, the Vermont Supreme Court, who is the uh, chairman of the uh, working group, to, um, to tell us about the working group and, um, and share some, some insight to the work. And, uh, and anything else you'd like to share with us? We, we always enjoy having you here in the committee. And uh, uh, this is certainly not going to be the first time. We hope you'll come back when we have more time and hopefully in the building. So, um, so yeah. you're up. Um, good morning and, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, as always, for this opportunity to speak uh, uh, to you, to talk with you. Uh, uh, I have to confess this morning I had a... Uh, uh, actually, a uh, vision of uh, walking to my desk. I'm in my house at uh, the desk where I work principally. I, I'm at court in Montpelier oh, a couple times a week, sometimes, although since the, uh, uh, since the spike has occurred, I've, I've, uh, I've stayed away. Um, but uh, I had a vision this morning of leaving my office, just thinking through, leaving my office and walking up the hill to your chamber for uh, th this discussion, which is something I always uh, relish, look forward to and enjoy doing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a people person. That's, that's the truth of the whole matter. You know, I just, I like, I like people. I like uh, talking to people. And um, we, uh, in the past, as some of you might remember, I had a uh, Friday morning, 8 a.m. Uh, visit where I just made myself available, usually brought some members of uh, either the court or the court administrator's office up uh, with me. And we uh, it was an opportunity to have casual conversations. We tried to do it last year uh, and it, it was OK, but, you know, very understandable. Um, it, it sort of. Uh, it wasn't the same. So I'm not doing it this year because I'm hoping that before too long, um, we're going to be back face to face. And uh, but that is not to say that uh, I don't uh, I'm not available, uh, certainly available uh, to each of you as uh, as uh, issues or questions may arise, as you probably well know, our court administrator, Pat Gable, has uh, taken a well-deserved retirement effective at the end of the last month. Uh, we have a uh, interim uh, court administrator, uh, Scott Griffith, uh, who uh, has uh, uh, really quite uh, extensive experience uh, before he joined us uh, coming. He came uh, to us from Texas, although he's originally from New England. And uh, he's filling in the seat uh, Pat's seat. Uh, for the moment, we are uh, embarking now, just now. Actually, we started in December uh, before Pat left on um, a, a search for a new court administrator. Uh, we've uh, engaged the National Center of State Courts for state courts uh, entity, uh, I think you're all familiar with, who uh, is based in Williamsburg, Virginia, and um, I've had a very strong and, and close relationship with those people for a number of years, and uh, they're very, very good. They're very professional, and they are uh, uh, helping us and uh, going to actually uh, act as a, uh, a secretariat, if you will, to the, to the effort we're putting together. Part of that effort, incidentally, which I published to the judicial branch yesterday, or the, maybe it was the day before, uh, includes the uh, establishment of a, uh, I, I don't think we're calling, I forget what we call it now, it's a committee. I, I, I want to say it's a search committee, but not, uh, not uh, particularly so. It, 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 here's how the process is going to work, if I can just lay that out, because you may be interested. Uh, the National Center for State Courts, we, we've, uh, we are about, it's very imminent now, 
to post a job description and an invitation to apply that'll go out nationally, uh, will be uh, obviously put up on our website, uh, will go on the National Center's website, uh, but it'll be posted in all of the usual places. There'll be a deadline for submitting applications uh, that I think is the end of January, somewhere in there. And then uh, the National Center in its role, and this is a very valuable uh, step uh, for us uh, to be uh, uh, to be to be certain. Uh, they're going to take a first cut at the applications we receive. You know, I I cannot predict how many applications we're going to receive. I tend to think we may receive quite quite a lot. Uh, I can tell you this: we I had um, uh, uh, just uh, I've just hired a new law clerk for starting next September. Uh, uh, a young man from uh, who's out at uh, uh, at uh, the law school in California, but uh, had a, has a JD from Harvard as well. But when I opened up the application process, uh, I was uh, stunned that we had over sixty applications uh, for this uh, opening, and my process for. Uh, soliciting applicants for this job is late, so to speak. Uh, usually, uh, we and uh, typically we would have advertised last summer, early last summer, uh, even uh, late uh, spring, uh, for a hiring decision by September of 2021. Uh, so I was late, and I could go into the reasons for that, but I won't unless you're interested. Uh, and anyway, but over 60 applicants, many very, very highly qualified people. And so I'm sort of uh, expecting that we're going to have a, a number of applications for Pat's job, uh, which would be very good. And, and uh, NCSC is going to take its first, the first cut uh, and whittle it down to five, six, seven, something like that. And then the committee that we've just appointed which includes trial judges, court clerks, uh, court operations managers, and others, uh, the Bar Association, um, they will then review the, uh, the first cut that the center sends to them, and they'll narrow it down to three or four, and they'll send that to the Supreme Court, and then we'll engage in our own process of interviews and a final selection. So that's how it's going to work. And I'm very hopeful we're going to have um, a permanent uh, new court administrator uh, this spring. Uh, but of course, uh, saying that, I'm reminded as well that, you know, one of our uh, dear colleagues, uh, Beth Robinson, has just left uh, to uh, join the federal bench. And so, as uh, I think all of you are probably aware, the uh, judicial nominating board is in the throes right now of uh, setting up interviews. And I, I'm not sure, I think the interviews may be even this weekend. I'm not clear when exactly it's going to take place, but I know that they, uh, to their credit, uh, have it on a fast track. Uh, so that's uh, much appreciated. Anyway, it's been a, a season of change. There's no question about that. We at the same time, I uh, had the retirement in the fall of uh, my good friend, Brian Grierson, uh, who uh, uh, took a well-deserved retirement at the end of uh, October, I think it was, November 1. Uh, and Terry Scott, who was the chief of um, trial court operations, uh, also retired and uh, uh, but we have replacements uh, for both of those jobs. Uh, Tom Zone, Judge Tom Zone, who I'm sure you'll get to know if you don't already, uh, has taken over in Judge Grierson's spot. And uh, Lori Candy, a terrific uh, person who has uh, got uh, a tremendous experience in the courts uh, for many, many years. Uh, and has the uh, uh, great respect of everybody in the branch. She has taken uh, Terry Scott's place and is doing, uh, she and uh, both she and Judge Zoni, I can't tell you how pleased I am with how uh, it is going. 
it's not to say that we uh, have uh, an easy road that we're traveling right now. It's it's there are many many uh, bumps. Uh, I visited up in St. Albans the other day, uh, face to face, uh, which uh, I've started doing a little more of, which I'm glad to be able to have the opportunity. Um, you know, courts. Some of the courts are in really uh, facing. A tough, tough uh, times. So there's no question that the the uh, uh, there's a backlog that has been built up, uh, particularly in uh, criminal cases, which is something that, uh, and it's not in every county, but it's in some counties, and uh, uh, we are working to uh, try to address it. Uh, obviously, the fact that people, some people, are in detention is a serious serious problem that weighs on us um uh, weighs on everyone and uh, uh we've moved some of these trials uh, jury trials uh, into other counties where uh, the courthouse in the uh, specific county where the defendant is lodged or is charged uh is not equipped for reasons of ventilation and uh uh etc is not equipped to handle a jury trial. So um, we're making progress, I would say. Uh, we're trying to hold our own. I think the morale is okay. It's uh, episodic, uh, but we're working very hard to try to maintain a positive attitude with folks, even as the, uh, you know, the, the virus recurs and, uh, you know, to the great, disappointment of everyone i'm sure i'll i'm happy to answer questions about any of that but i know the time is is limited and i want to speak to you um specifically about the chair's request uh, regarding justice reinvestment this is a terrific project that um the uh, your leadership and the governor and i signed on as well uh uh, uh pursued began a couple years ago uh, it's Justice Reinvestment 2, Roman numeral 2, and I could tell you something about Roman numeral 1, but I won't take up time doing that now. But it started, uh, this project started, uh, I think, three or four years ago. This is the second iteration of, the, of, of Justice Reinvestment 2 that has just concluded at the end of December, and it, uh, uh, it I think, was quite successful and i can't say enough about uh your uh, uh uh chamber's involvement uh your chair's involvement and others uh in uh, contributing to the work that the uh that was done uh, uh uh some of which was was uh difficult and not uh easy for sure uh but the you know the principle behind the reinvestment effort this is how i have viewed it, and I think others as well, is that it was a process uh, rooted in the truth and trying to get to the truth of what our uh, particular situation uh, is in Vermont with regard to incarceration uh, and related uh, matters. Uh, and I think that the uh, people from uh, the Council of State Governments, the Justice Center, who assisted in this effort uh, really were uh, just uh, very professional. They were terrific. The, the proceedings, uh, the effort that was undertaken, which principally included uh, the production of uh, data and statistics from all three branches with respect to these difficult issues about uh, people uh, aging in the, in the jails, uh, 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 about a racial justice, which is an extremely important issue. I think the pursuit of the, of the understanding of these issues was done uh, uh, certainly in good faith and with humility uh, uh, demonstrated by everyone who uh, uh, was willing to accept uh, uh, and recognize the uh, faults in our own systems, mine included. And the point of being, of course, to uh, try to improve how we're approaching uh, uh, the uh, not only the identity of the issues, but 
also uh, resolution and, and uh, engagement in the uh, process of re resolution. Um, you know, the, the, the court, my court is now considering uh, as a result of this effort, uh, and we will soon convene a, um, uh, a commission on racial justice in the courts. Uh, the, if you read the report that is issued now out of uh, the Justice Reinvestment II project, uh, what you see is that, um, and I've got some of these numbers written down, I wanna get them right, uh, that in 2019, uh, black people in the state of Vermont were three times more likely to be a defendant in a misdemeanor case. They were six times more likely than whites uh, to be a defendant in felony cases. And they were 14 times more likely uh, than whites to be a defendant in felony drug cases. Uh, they were six times more likely jailed uh, than uh, the white population. Uh, and by the way, each of these disparities remains even when uh, the statistics are controlled uh, for uh, matters of uh, residency uh, and criminal history. In other words, um, I think, I know uh, there was a, a great um, suspicion initially uh, that any numbers that uh, we uh, 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 found uh, through these efforts uh, that showed a higher incidence of racial disparity in sentencing and incarceration and charging as well uh, what would be uh, mainly attributed to the fact that we have uh, out-of-staters who come through Vermont are either trafficking sometimes in drugs uh, or <coughs> are um, uh, you know coming through Vermont for whatever reason and are are arrested and incarcerated and so the suspicion initially was that that was what would account for any of these racial disparities what CSG found was to the contrary even when adjusted uh, for those factors for uh, uh, residency and criminal history by the way uh, as well there still were these very very substantial uh, conflicts, if you will, uh, between uh, uh, the uh, incidence of, uh, of, uh, of incarceration uh, for uh, these different kinds of uh, charges, both misdemeanors, felonies, and felony drug cases. Uh, and uh, 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 none of those factors, neither of those factors account for it. So I know that there is a uh, legislation that is uh, is going to be proposed. Some of the work of the, of the uh, I think a very important part of the work of the reinvestment effort uh, focused on uh, the, the, uh, the schedule, if I can call it that, of, uh, pro of probation and parole, uh, furlough, uh, uh, these kinds of release uh, uh, initiatives that uh, the legislature has undertaken over the years in order quite understandably to provide incentive to uh, criminal defendants uh, to uh, address uh, their uh, problems that uh, uh, wind up uh, creating uh, uh, high rates of recidivism. Uh, but uh, the uh, number uh, and variety of different sorts of uh, early release programs that we had sponsored, to my understanding from CSG's uh, work, uh, we, we stood alone uh, in the country uh, in uh, uh, respect to such a complex and very different approach in a way that um, uh, perhaps uh, is not uh, beneficial ultimately to uh, the defendants and to the system uh, that we're uh, uh, trying to manage. So uh, that is another area that the, uh, that the effort uh, focused on. Uh, so our commission, uh, the final thing I wanted to point out is that what we're going to do is to look at uh, the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion 
uh, putting together a commission of people who are uh, representative interests of uh, different aspects of the justice system. <laughs> Excuse me. The point being that uh, over a period of time, they will report back to the Supreme Court, uh, reflecting on a, a better understanding of the uh, problem uh, that exists, uh, including uh, uh, the lack of data, which is a serious problem in, uh, in our branch. Uh, we don't have the kind of data that we really need in order to make a proper analysis of, of this problem uh, with an, un so that uh, the first step will be to gain a better understanding uh, and then to uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, uh, the problems that are uh, identified and finally to take action. And these will be through recommendations again uh, to the Supreme Court. I expect that the effort will take place over the next year and a half or so. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's a very important part. It's part of a national focus, by the way, that has been brought to bear by, again, uh, our friends at the National Center for State Courts, who have actually convened a special uh, task force that is uh, looking at this and uh, helping states like ours uh, come to grips with uh, uh, inequities in, in the way in which justice is, is administered. By the way, uh, I do not uh, perceive uh, uh, overt uh, discrimination on the part of any judge uh, in this state. He is doing their work. Uh, we have uh, already in place uh, uh, extensive training that takes place with new judges in particular uh, and new staff as well, by the way, with regard to uh, matters of bias and implicit bias, which is an extremely important aspect of this problem. Uh, so this is not a new uh, question. The issue of bias and prejudice is not a new question for us um, in this regard, uh, because we have been uh, taking it seriously uh, for many years. But uh, that's not to say uh, that we have ever made a, a full uh, evaluation of the of the potential uh, for there being issues of uh, implicit uh, discrimination or even overt uh, discrimination in the way in which we uh, are operating all of the various aspects of the justice system, including committees, boards, uh, commissions, and the like. And it's uh, very important for us to. Uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we are taking uh, effective steps uh, to address uh, uh, these problems such as they may exist. So I'd be happy to uh, answer uh, any questions. Uh, those are the comments I have, Madam Chair. i uh, be happy to answer any questions that uh, members may have. Okay, thank you. We have very few minutes because we do need to join the, uh, the joint hearing with the other committee. Uh, any questions? Anybody have a quick question? It's hard because I'm sure we have so much to ask and to discuss with you. So I think maybe I'll be, be glad maybe, to come back. Be glad yeah, to come back anytime. Come back. Yeah, but I want to thank you so much for highlighting the, um, the very disturbing racial disparities that that yeah. many of us knew uh, have existed throughout the system, but frankly, haven't uh, taken the necessary, um, many of us have taken necessary leadership, but not really have not um, yeah, yeah. done as much as we could and should. And I'm certainly uh, committed to continuing continuing the work and, and members of this committee have been very involved in um, looking at the data, the lack of data. Um, Representative Lalonde and, and um, Christy um, have been working um, right. all summer long last year and also summer long in fall. So you'll see a bill on that. And um, so really, really do appreciate you um, being here and, and unders underscoring uh, really how important the work is and the need for us to, to really do the work and, and make it a priority. So I, I appreciate it on, on behalf of Thank the Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the work you all are doing. Very Great. grateful for that. Great. All right. I'll come back again. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks so a lot.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So committee, um, Amber sent us the link, which is very helpful um, at 841 this morning, right? Everybody have it. So we'll switch over to that, to that link because that's um, House Judiciary. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.